Thank you, Kathy, and good morning. I'm very grateful uh, to be here at the invitation of uh, Pastor Jacob. Uh, as Kathy mentioned, my name is uh, Nate Addington, and, and when I'm not moonlighting as an extremely mediocre pulpit supply, uh, I do work at the College of Worcester as their uh, Director of Experiential Learning and Community Engagement. Uh, in that light, Pastor Jacob has asked me to speak with you today uh, as a way of providing you an update uh, with some things that are going on uh, on campus. And he asked me to fill a, a 20 minute ish window. Uh, but as I'm sitting here, I'm reminded uh, of the words of my grandfather when I was going to church growing up that said, anything worth saying should be done in 10 minutes or less. Otherwise, they're just nodding along to be polite. So uh, we'll do our best, uh, as he would say, to get in and get out and beat the Methodists to breakfast. So Jacob gave me the following prompts today. Uh, first, to discuss with you the culture of service on campus. Second, to elaborate on the value the college places on community partnerships. And finally, uh, to share with you how my own personal faith journey has impacted my role at the college. And I think we'll actually start uh, with that last one because in a way, being here with you all this morning is a bit of a homecoming for me on a variety uh, of fronts. I grew up in a very small uh, town in the northwest corner of the state, Archbold, Ohio, uh, which was founded uh, and is still heavily populated by members of the Mennonite Church. As I'm seeing the nods, I'm sure that you are all aware. And I found myself in uh, my youth engaging uh, with my friends at their churches, going to their evening Bible studies and worshiping on Sunday, and engaging in the service projects that those Mennonite churches championed in our hometown, and often finding myself really enchanted by the work those churches were doing with the Mennonite Central Committee, uh, and to a young and impressionable youth, uh, that seemed like something that I might want to find myself caught up in someday. And so it was really no surprise, I think, to many in my life that uh, I found myself just down the highway from here a few miles at Ashland University, uh, again surrounded by Anabaptists, uh, to the chagrin, I think, of my Catholic family, uh, really learning and studying uh, from them as I engaged in my undergraduate degree in uh, religion and ethics. And I was really influenced by Ashland's uh, pietist heritage, right, that higher education um, really could change the world, right? That by changing people through education, you could impact things. And I was really just enamored with that. I was a first-gen college student, and so that really kind of hit home with me. And so while I was at Ashland, I really found myself heavily engaged with their campus ministry activities. In particular, uh, I did find myself involved with the Newman Group on campus. Of the 100 and so some groups on campus, just like here at the College of Worcester, uh, I found that they were the group that was doing work in the community that most resembled what I grew up doing with my Mennonite friends. And so I gravitated uh, to that group and, and again immersed myself in trying to study the, the, the theological underpinnings of why they were doing these things. And I found myself reading John Henry Newman's book, uh, An Idea of the University, and, and really just uh, again being in, encapsulated that his argument that a college degree and a university structure in general is, is more than just a means to an end. Right? It's not just about a credential that you can hang on the wall. It's just not, a, not uh, as maybe today's uh, American culture demands, a way to get a high-paying job. But it was a way that you could grow in wisdom. And that that wisdom that you gain could be used for the benefit of all society. And that if you applied yourself rightly so that God might impart in you the tools to build the kingdom of God in the here and now, and not just sit idly by and waiting in some eschatological hope for a, a kingdom that might come in the distant and far off future, that you could begin that work today. And I found that simply amazing. And so for just about 10 years after undergraduate, I found myself in active ministry through my graduate studies in theology, and I worked with a church in Toledo that had 4,500 families, not individuals, but families. 
And that was a little bit too big for me growing up in Archbold, Ohio, where there were 2,000 people, and then going to Ashland, which was also veritably small. And so I found myself actually back at Ashland uh, as their campus minister, and then later here at the College of Worcester in a very similar role. And so you might be wondering, uh, given that background, how some seven years later I find myself uh, in my current role. And the reason is, right about the time that I, I got to Worcester, I, I really had the self-realization that, that my call to ministry was really kind of coming uh, to an end. And that self-realization came right about the time of some significant changes at the College of Worcester. Did you all see those data reflexes right there? You see that? I grabbed that really quick before it fell. My son would be very impressed by that. So, uh, Significant changes at the College of Worcester. Our chaplain of 21 years, who I'm sure many of you had the opportunity to work with, had decided to leave for a new institution in Wisconsin. We had brought in a new president and a new vice president of student affairs within about two months of each other. And in the summer of 2016, they brought me in and they asked me, they said, Nate, we'd like you to do two things. One, would you serve as the interim chaplain and find us a, a new chaplain that, that wouldn't be you? No offense. It's that whole Presbyterian underpinning. And they said, two, we'd really uh, like for you to figure out this whole civic and, and community engagement stuff that's been happening, but really up until this point has had no uh, person specifically ushering it. And I was very uh, excited by that because I think I had realized that I, at that point in my life, I had been using my ministry as a tool to engage in the community and to engage in these conversations about the purpose of education. And I didn't feel that ministry should be used as anything except for ministry onto itself. And that just because I had an, an interest in those things, that an interest didn't always equal call. And so I made the uh, uh, this decision to, to step out of that uh, ministry opportunity that I had been in, and we launched the new office of what I was suggesting at the time, and you think my title now is long, the Office of Civic and Community Engagement and Social Responsibility, to mirror the language that we use in our graduate qualities. Uh, I was told that was too long of a name, as the acronym would be O-C-C-E-C-S-R. Uh, and they thought that people might find that confusing. Uh, and so they shortened it to the Office of Civic and Social Responsibility. And for the last two years, that's really the uh, work that I've been engaged in, uh, is shepherding the commission of that office. This past summer, it was announced that my office was actually going to be merging with the Office of Experiential Learning in Apex, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, as uh, John Ramsey was the champion of that work. And uh, if you hadn't noticed, he is a congregation member here. So if you have questions about Apex and experiential learning, I'm sure John would be willing to answer those. And so uh, I still think now this gives us the title of the longest office on campus now, the Office of uh, Experiential Learning and Community Engagement. So try as they might, we still can't get away from the long titles. And that's uh, where we are today. Uh, a little over two months into this new office structure, we're working our way through those questions of, of who and what we are and wrestling with those same questions that I have engaged in and love so much about what is the purpose of this work that we're doing and how might we do that to a further degree and to the highest caliber possible. And that brings me to Pastor Jacob's second question, which was to talk about the culture of service on campus something of which I think Worcester has been known uh, for many years. I recently found a quote that I think summarizes this well, and it comes from Carl Compton, class of 08. I should specify that's 1908. Uh, after he graduated, he went on to do a few things, including being president of MIT. And it was actually during that time that he said this. He said, I think I have been away from Worcester long enough and have been interested enough in other institutions to be able to view this college rather objectively. And it is in this spirit that I would express the conviction that there is no college of my acquaintance, including MIT, in the country which seems to me to do as good a job in bringing forth the best that is in its students and giving them a great urge for a career of service. Some 100 years later, uh, I firmly believe that that's still true today. 
Our students, regardless of their major or their background, continue to graduate and to go into amazing careers of service to others. In 2018, the largest field that our students found themselves working in the year after graduation was in direct service to others through nonprofit work and human services followed directly uh, after by work serving in K through 12 education and in environmental regulations at number three and number five, respectively. Now that's not a fluke. I checked with our director of career services and for the last 24 years, which happens to be the number of years that she has kept record, every year the number one field our students go into the year after graduation is in direct service and nonprofit work or in human services. And that Spirit is very much alive on campus as well, not just outside after graduation. Last year alone, my office tracked 21,352 hours of direct service that our students gave to the community. That only includes things that my office tracked. That does not include any hours that our students served through athletics, through Greek organizations, or the average student who just happened to find themselves in the community engaging without uh, our help, that is our the go-getters, 21,000 hours. We have 162 students that live in service-based housing that are not only living and studying on campus, but are contributing to the larger community. And I think that that culture is due to a great many factors, but one of them I think is our evolving definition of service. We've been making very intentional shifts uh, and steps to move away from equating service with just direct volunteerism. It's not that direct volunteerism is bad, right? In and of itself, it's a wholly good thing, but we don't want to be comfortable ending there, right? We want volunteerism to be that first step in an ever-deepening pedagogical approach that I'm calling service and. We want our students to do service and critical reflection. We want our students to do service and advocacy, service and philanthropy, service and community-based education, social entrepreneurship, politics and policy. Service and needs to be our new future, that, and I think it would be a future that Carl Compton would be very excited about. And that brings us to Jacob's third prompt, which was the value of community partnerships. Now, in the scripture reading today, we heard Paul uh, talk to the early church in Rome about the importance of community and that in each individual knowing what their individual gifts were, being able to identify those things, and then to lean into those as a part of the communal whole. And I think Pastor Jacob is here, but maybe not in this room, which is good because I might be playing a little fast and loose with my exegesis, uh, but I think that we can make the same collective argument uh, today for what Paul is advocating for. Um, that we, as an individual, are also we in the collective sense, right? Uh, that we are the communal body, that the College of Worcester is we, that Worcester Mennonite is we, that people to people, United Way, the Chamber of Commerce, we are all the collective we of this community, these individual parts that make up uh, this city that we all call home, or this uh, area of Wayne County that we all call home, and we're called to work towards the betterment of society. We're called, as Paul says, to contribute to the needs of the saints here in Wayne County and beyond. And that's noble work, and it's hard work, and it's work that we can't accomplish individually. The College of Worcester, as Paul says, needs to realize some sense of humbleness that we can't ride in on a white horse from an ivy tower and say, we'll fix the problems in the community. But that's not going to work. But when we work together collectively, we put all our energy into reestablishing and reinforcing community partnership, and we leverage the gifts and the expertise that each of us contribute, then good things can happen. And that's why I'm really excited about this new combined office effort. And the an analogy that I've been using is if, if you would go down to Madison Avenue, uh, here, not New York City, uh, and you would knock on the door at Worcester Brush, and you would say, dear Worcester Brush, uh, we are doing some work uh, in the community. What might you contribute? It would be appropriate for Worcester Brush to give you painting supplies, because that is what they produce. 
And so I've begun to ask myself, what is it that we produce at the College of Worcester? Knowledge, scholarship, leaders of character and influence, at least that's what our mission statement tells us we should be producing. And then to ask the question, how might the fact that we produce this be used to benefit the larger community? Because if we can find new and exciting ways for us to advance our mission of educating students, of advancing their educational pursuits, while at the same time solving problems that have been collectively identified by the community, well, that's a sweet spot that I think that we should lean into. And I think it's a sweet spot that is really embedded in the core foundation of who we are as an institution for these past 150 years. And I would argue likely has been embedded in you all here at Worcester Mennonite. And so my question for you and, and for all of us really is this, is what are we going to contribute? What part of that collective whole, what part of that body are we? And how do we work together to bring those individual parts together for the benefit of all. Now the good news is if you're not quite sure of that answer, don't worry. I happen to know a community partner that you all have that is just down the road that specializes in the reflective practices of self-discovery. And so I leave you today with a word of gratitude and thanksgiving. I want to thank you for your time and for your hospitality today. Paul ends that, that great passage in Romans by saying to practice hospitality, and I have felt that, and I thank you. But I also want to thank you for our past partnerships. We mentioned, Kathy mentioned, those things that we've done here together, those things that have borne great fruit. But I also want to thank you in advance for future partnerships, for all that, that you will do and that we will do together for the students at the College of Worcester, for all that you will do and all that we will do together for our neighbors here in this community, as we continue to develop experiences together that make a difference to those in need, and as we continue to change the world by changing people. I thank you again for your time today, and I think my grandfather would be proud. I'm, by my estimation, we're at 12. So thank you so much. <laughs>